we're ready. Uh, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. We're pleased to have you join us for the September 2019 California Current Acidification Network Ocean Acidification Roundtable Discussion. The title of today's presentation is How Ocean Acidification Works Hand in Hand. Oh, well, to <laughs> how ocean acidification works hand in hand with warming and other global change stressors to promote toxic pseudonutsia, harmful algae blooms along the West Coast. This series is so hosted by CCAN. In short, the series is intended to create a dialogue and facilitate understanding and collaboration among industry members, natural resource managers, and scientists within the California current ecosystem. I'm Bruce Steele, a member of CCAN webinar committee. I'll be moderating. Terry King from Washington Sea Grant and CCAN chair will run the logistics of today's session. During the presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. You're welcome to type questions for the presenter into the questions box at the bottom of the control panel on the right of your screen. We will be monitoring incoming questions and we'll respond to them after the presentation. We will also, we are also recording this session and we'll share the recording on the CCAN website. We are very excited to have Dr. Dave Hutchins speaking with us today. Dave Hutchins is Professor of Marine and Environmental Biology at University of Southern California, LA. Most of his current research examines how glo global change processes affect marine biology, ocean biology, and biogeochemistry. Particular areas of interest include how future ocean acidification, sea surface warming, and changing ocean biology, chemistry, and physics will impact harmful algae blooms, carbon and nutrient cycling, iron and trace metal cycling, nitrogen fixation, and phytoplankton community structure in marine ecosystems. Dr. Hutchins received his PhD at UC Santa Cruz, followed a postdoc at Stony Brook, then worked 10 years on the facility at the University of Delaware before moving to USC 12 years ago. Uh, I'll hand it over to Dave for his presentation. Thank you, Bruce, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to give this uh, talk today for the CCAN community. Let me see if I can get this working the way I want it. Um, so yeah, you've already given my uh, title here. Um, this is a uh, work that's uh, being, a lot of it is being supported by uh, USC Sea Grant, and I definitely need to uh, um, acknowledge them. So let's go on and talk about um, some of the kinds of changes that are going on in the ocean today. So um, we all, uh, because you're uh, tuning into CCAN, I assume that you're quite familiar with ocean acidification. Um, it's a big, big problem that a lot of us are uh, working on. This uh, little graphic here shows the situation today and the situation sometime in the future, say to year 2100. And we all know there's more CO2 coming into the ocean, and that's going to cause the pH to decrease in the future. <clears throat> but we also know there's a lot of other things going on with global change at the same time. And this shows some of them. The most obvious one is the world's getting warmer, the ocean's getting warmer. So it, the, we expect increases in average uh, sea surface temperatures of anywhere from four to six degrees, depending on where you are. And then there's other things too that are happening at the same time. For instance, uh, the ocean is losing oxygen. Hypoxic areas are expanding. Um, another uh, side, um, uh, effect of warming is that the mixed layer depth is pre is predicted to shallow and the um, the density gradient between surface water and deep water will get more um, more pronounced and so what's going to happen is organisms that live up in the surface ocean are going to be held closer to the surface by this shallower mixed layer they're going to see more solar radiation but they're gonna see less nutrients because of this increasing um, barrier to mixing across the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the picnic line there. And we also know 
that there are harmful algal blooms that are spreading all over uh, the world. Harmful algal blooms seem to be getting worse in extent, in severity, um, and in frequency all over the world. Seems like this are becoming all too uh, common. Um, this is um, a right whale calf uh, that was killed by the same toxin. We have uh, problems with here that I'll be talking about, domoic acid produced by Pseudonychia, but this is uh, in Argentina. So we're not the only ones uh, in the West Coast um, that have problems with um, domoic acid and Pseudonychia. Um, obviously, um, most of you are aware that um, both paralytic shellfish poisoning is a problem in areas like Puget Sound and Alaska um, and other parts of the West Coast, but domoic acid also has caused uh, major closures of shell fisheries um, going on for years. And it's impacting not only our ocean environment, but also our ocean economy. Um, the people, many of you that depend on harvesting resources from the ocean are paying a big price for this. Um, this is the kind of thing uh, that we've seen, the um, unprecedented uh, um, incidences of um, harmful algal blooms. So this is a huge mortality of red, valuable red abalone that happened in 2011 in Northern California. Um, and this was caused by an organism called Gonyalax, which never had caused problems in California before. It just kind of suddenly appeared and started making yesa toxins and caused a, a major shellfish die off. Um, other parts of the world, here's China, they're having, in Qingdao, they're having huge blooms of macroalgae. So this is ulva, and they have these poor policemen out there trying to uh, clear it off with their bare hands. It doesn't look like a very fun job to me. Um, in an issue of science, uh, just a few weeks ago, um, it talks about sargassum bloom. So this floating seaweed in the tropical Atlantic has been building up into huge harmful algal blooms that are burying beaches in the Caribbean and Central America and has suddenly become a problem. So all over the world, we're having issues. And a lot of people have linked these uh, increasing harmful algal bloom issues to things like climate change issues, temperature increases, and of course, acidification, as well as things like hypoxia and shoaling of the mixed layer. We, we uh, think that climate change has something to do with this expansion of harmful algal blooms globally, and also um, the ones that we're concerned with in the North Pacific. Of course, human nutrient inputs are not decreasing in most of the ocean too. So that's another anthropogenic impact that can interact with these other uh, variables. Here is some evidence from the San Francisco Bay Area from Jim Clorn a few uh, years ago. He shows when you have active upwelling and nice cold nutrient rich water, you get healthy diatom blooms dominated by things like Hatoceros. But when it warms up and, and upwelling ceases, you get dinoflagellate blooms that uh, move in instead. Um, Here's another example of changes in harmful algal blooms uh, globally. This is Northern Europe. These are four uh, harmful algal bloom dinoflagellates. And these red areas show where they're moving into new places farther north where they've never been seen before. And this has uh, been um, attributed to increases in temperature um, in these areas. And finally, here's the coast of Asia. Here's Korea, Japan, China. Um, Cochlidinium is another one that is showing uh, higher growth rates and a longer bloom season um, as the uh, ocean gets warmer. So it, it's, uh, the evidence is really mounting that climate change uh, as a whole, including ocean acidification, but also all those other factors I mentioned are involved in this. This is one of my favorite graphs from uh, Moore et al. 2008. She looked at the bloom window for toxic Alexandrium in Puget Sound, which is about two months now, but this graph does a nice job of showing as the ocean warms up two degrees, you almost double the bloom season 
at uh, four degrees, you triple it, and at six degrees, it lasts for most of the year, almost nine months of the year. So this is, an, again, a warming issue, not an ocean acidification issue. So let's get down and start talking about pseudonychia. Most of you that are listening probably familiar with it. I'll give a little introduction, but I think probably the reason you're listening is because you're already well aware of the Penne diatoma genus pseudonychia and the kind of huge blooms it can make. This is the Juan de Fuca eddy, which is one of the big hot spots for pseudonychia blooms up in the Northwest. And this is the toxin that it makes, domoic acid. Um, uh, is a very potent neurotoxin that uh, is the cause of amnesiac shellfish poisoning. Um, we know if, the, um, if toxic pseudonychia are present, they will accumulate um, demoic acid mostly in their cells. Most of it's not released to the water. And then that gets into the food chain and it's uh, accumulated um, at every trophic transfer. And it ends up in things like sea lions at the top of the uh, food chain and causes major problems, uh, deaths of seabirds and marine mammals. Here's a big bull sea lion that is likely been poisoned by demoic acid and is climbing out of the ocean onto uh, Highway 1 in California. This is my ex-graduate student. I'll show you some of his data today, uh, Avery Tatters, and he was on his way to sur going surfing. He pulled over to talk to this cop who's keeping an eye on the sea lion. And he's telling him about neurotoxins and trophic transfer. I'm not sure exactly what the cop uh, thinks of this. I do notice he looks a little skeptical and is keeping his hand on his gun here. This uh, guy with the um, dreadlocks has got him a little worried. But you all know these issues probably um, uh, as well as I do. So let's talk about some of the experimental work we did. We are concerned about how ocean acidification is going to affect pseudonychia blooms, both um, in the western uh, part of North America and uh, around the world. The first experiment we did was this one back in 2011. We got a, a culture from eastern Canada, not a local one, but then we grew it at three CO2 concentrations. 190 ppm, like a pre-industrial, a 380 ppm, which was um, which was the uh, the am the um, present day when we did the experiment. It's higher now, and 750, which is a future uh, a CO2 concentration. And we knew from previous work that phosphorus limitation would intensify demoic acid production. So we did all three of these CO2 concentrations both P-replete and P-limited. We grew cultures and we measured demoic acid and we also took RNA samples, which I didn't write down here for gene expression. Let me show you some of the results we got from that early work. So here are the growth rates of our cultures and just to orient you, this is growth rate on this axis. Down here, these three bars represent the phosphorus limited treatments. These three bars are the phosphorus repeat treatments. And in each of those phosphorus uh, conditions, um, this is low, medium, and high CO2, low, medium, and high. And you can see right away that they grow faster when you give them phosphorus than when they're phosphorus limited. No surprise there. But you can see that whether they are phosphorus limited or phosphorus replete, they always increase the amount of um, demoic acid they make as CO2 goes up. So the proximate uh, cause um, of, um, the proximate cause of, uh, excuse me, the growth rates increase um, with CO2, not the demoic acid, that's the next slide. This is, so you can see growth rates go up with CO2 regardless of whether they're phosphorus limited or phosphorus replete. Same story for carbon fixation. But let's look at the toxins now. How do, how do they look in this experiment? So it's a little bit uh, unexpected if you don't know anything about pseudonychia, but uh, the phosphorus replete ones hardly make any demoic acid. And we've known that for a while. The phosphorus limited ones are the ones that produce demoic acid. But 
once they're making demoic acid, when you put them at high CO2, they make a tremendous amount more of demoic acid than they do uh, just from phosphorus limitation alone. And you can see that in the cellular DA is almost five times as high at future CO2 than at present day CO2 in the phosphorus limited treatments, a lot more. And this is dissolved DNA, uh, DA, it's a, um, it's an order of magnitude lower because they don't release most of it, but it has the same trends. Um, the, the CO2 actually exacerbates the demoic acid production that's caused in the first place by phosphorus limitation. So luckily we did put away um, gene expression samples, RNA, and froze those away uh, because these samples um, were used in a paper that came out last year. And the reason that they were so valuable is because this shows we can turn DA off and on like a spigot, basically, just by controlling the amount of nutrients it's getting and the amount of CO2. So we can manipulate our cultures to produce very little demoic acid or a lot by just by changing their phosphorus con uh, availability and uh, CO2. And that was really valuable because uh, it allowed um, people to uh, cut them up for the first time, excuse me, with um, the um, synthesis pathway for, de for demoic acid, which this, these samples were used to uh, figure out um, in a science paper last year, a Brunson et al. science paper. No one knew how demoic acid is made. That science paper, uh, elucidated the whole uh, gene um, complement that is involved in DA um, synthesis, which is gonna move us way forward in this field because now we can do things like go out in the field and look for expression of these genes in natural demoic acid producing uh, um, blooms of pseudonychia. Um, and it, it could be act as a biomarker for instance. Um, here is another experiment that, uh, that Avery that I showed you his picture earlier did. Um, we used a, a Pseudonychia fraudulenta that we isolated in Southern California here. Again, a similar uh, design of an experiment. We grew it across three CO2 concentrations, but this time we grew it with silicate and without silicate, or silicate limited, not without, low levels. So this is a different nutrient limiting it now. But this is also known to increase demoic acid production. And as you'll see, the CO2 again uh, intensifies or magnifies the effects of nutrient limitation. Um, oh, here, this is out of order, sorry. This is the uh, biosynthesis paper that I was talking about of the um, demoic acid uh, synthesis um, that our, our samples were used for. So this is the, um, the silicon limited uh, results. So the open symbols are the re replete cultures and they don't make much demoic acid at all. The silicon limited ones do make it as we knew uh, from before. But again, look, as CO2 goes up from here to here to here, you get more and more demoic acid being produced in these silicate limited uh, cultures. So what's happening is that the um, silicate limitation or phosphorus limitation is triggering demoic acid production, but ocean acidification is intensifying that. Um, there is some supporting field data for this. This is from McIntyre et al, 2011. Uh, they did a survey across an estuary gradient. So they, as they saw CO2 concentrations go up as they went down the estuary to the open ocean, Silicate concentrations went down. So here's the condition of the high CO2, low silicate. And sure enough, pseudonychia abundance went up. It's not shown here, but demoic acid levels actually went up with it. So it's a similar uh, response to the ones we saw in our cultures. So demoic acid and CO2, um, I didn't show you the carlidinium data, so ignore that, but the cell-specific toxicity of pseudonychia is greatly increased by this synergistic interaction 
between nutrient limitation and elevated PCO2. So some of the points to consider um, is that we know there's a lot of economic impacts of ocean acidification on larval development of bivalves and calcification, but it also seems that, uh, that um, acidification is going to increase the toxicity of HABs, in particular Pseudonychia that we're talking about today. Um, and uh, it's something that we need to think about ocean acidification, but not in isolation in combination with these other uh, variables, like nutrient limitation, like um, uh, changes in warming and in temperature of the ocean. So let's talk about that for a minute. This is one of my favorite warming slides. It was, uh, it's given out by Ed Hawkins at uh, Reading University. It's free to use if you know somebody who's Skeptical still about the earth warming up, show them this. This is very convincing, I think. These are all the countries of the world uh, grouped by continent. And what they're looking at is the, temp the average temperature relative to the whole time period from 1900 to 2018. Each row of pixels here is a country. So the US would be, they're in alphabetical order, it would be down here somewhere. But it, it shows you that no matter where you are in the world, the world is getting hotter. There's no doubt about it. And we need to consider that when we're talking about um, harmful algal blooms and domoic acid, as well as ocean acidification. And as a lot of you know, we have our own major warming issues here. We had a, the, um, the massive heat wave event that happened in the North Pacific went from late 2014 to early 2016, the blob bloom, they called it, um, in which uh, ocean temperatures were much warmer than uh, they normally are. And it just sat there for over a year. And as you also know, uh, this McCabe, really nice McCabe uh, paper shows um, that there was tremendous uh, um, Pseudonychia bloom, the biggest one that's ever been seen, um, and the most toxic one, the highest levels of toxins. And they go through here and show you all the different shellfish closures, crab closures, uh, impacts on um, uh, marine mammals and wildlife, anchovy closures. It was a disaster for the West Coast, and a lot of you are well aware of that because you were caught up in this huge toxic bloom. So we isolated a culture of a toxic pseudonychia near the beginning of the blob event. Um, and we used that to look at the thing that was costing uh, West Coast Dungeness crab fishery as much, has been estimated as much as $100 million. Um, so we, we thought it was pretty urgent to look at temperature effects on domoic acid production. And we just fortuitously had an isolate that we got right at the beginning of the blob bloom of a toxic pseudonychia. Of course, cra the crab fishery was basically destroyed by this bloom and a lot, of, uh, a lot of families had trouble paying their bills up and down the coast um, because of this, uh, the crabs were far too toxic to sell. Um, and uh, this has all been um, put into a video by uh, Rachel Becker. If you haven't seen this at The Verge, here's the, um, the URL. You can go and watch this video. So she goes through and talks about the blob bloom and the, the toxic uh, pseudonychia that resulted and the impacts on the crab industry um, along our coastline. And then she also goes into uh, something that I know a lot of you are also aware of, is that the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations is suing the oil companies for climate change damages. And um, it's a bit of a um, David versus Goliath battle there to take on the biggest companies in the world, but we need to um, wish them well with this lawsuit because uh, they really do need some, um, some help. So let's look at the results of those experiments that we did with the, that toxic pseudonychia um, 
culture versus temperature. So this is a pretty simple experiment. We took this culture, we grew it across a range of temperatures from 12 degrees C up to 30 degrees C. It's what we call a thermal response curve. And uh, as, a, as is normal for phytoplankton, growth increases with temperature up to an optimum point, in this case, 23 degrees for this isolate, and then decreases very quickly after that as it gets into stressful high temperatures until it basically dies um, by about 30 degrees. Um, but the interesting thing was when we analyzed the demoic acid produced in this experiment, this isolate didn't even produce demoic acid at all until we hit its optimum temperature. And then as growth rates declined due to stressful high heat, the demoic acid levels went up and up and up. And this suggests to us that a bloom can grow in the, the early stages um, when there's upwelling and nutrients and the water's a bit cooler, um, that it will grow and produce a lot of cells, but they will be uh, not very toxic. But as the um, temperature goes up, if a heat wave event moves in, they will switch over to being quite stressed and they'll begin cranking out the, de the demoic acid. That's our interpretation of this, is that stressful high temperatures um, produce uh, high levels of demoic acid, at least in this isolate. This is the same data, to, and I want to show you a different way. So this is the amount of demoic acid per cell versus the growth rates in the culture. And you can see below 23 degrees, that optimum temperature, there's, as I said, there's basically no demoic acid at all in the culture. There's no relationship between growth rates and demoic acid because there is no demoic acid. But if you look at those declining growth rates above 23, where it's under thermal stress, there's a very strong linear relationship, inverse relationship, that the lower the growth rate drops, the higher the domoic acid content of the cells. So we also did some natural community experiments as part of this uh, study. So this is Pseudonychia delicatissima in a natural community with a lot of other um, phytoplankton mixed in. So delicatissima is not a toxic Pseudonychia. It's one of the non-toxic ones, and uh, it just happened to be the one that was there when we did the experiment. So we need to do this again with some toxic uh, uh, communities. But what you can see is as we increase the incubation temperature of this community, the Pseudonychia uh, dominant became more and more dominant until it was almost 50% of the cells. In this experiment, nothing much happened until 28, and then it took off and began to um, increase its dominance. So warming not only made our toxic uh, pseudonychia um, more toxic, but it made this pseudonychia uh, uh, become more dominant in the um, community. Just, just because a picture is worth a thousand words, here's some um, photos through the microscope from those uh, experiments. So the arrows show you pseudonychia cells at 15 degrees C where we isolated it. There was only a few and lots of other uh, things present here. But when we got it up to 28 degrees, it turned into almost a pure culture of pseudonychia. So it was dominating the community. There's still a few other cells left, but you can see how many more pseudonychia there are at a warm temperature. So our conclusion from this, and we need to look at more isolates and more communities, but our preliminary conclusion is that both toxicity and abundance of some pseudonychia species can be greatly increased by warming, which is exactly what we saw during the blob bloom. And this is in a very uh, um, uh, interesting paper that came out in PNAS by McKibben et al. And they, they uh, went back and looked at historical data sets and they find whenever you have the warm phase, climate phase of the Pacific de Decadal Oscillation, of course you get warmer sea surface temperatures, they correlate very closely, but they also correlate pretty well with um, the amount of ma maximum uh, demoic acid that's been reported. So warmer water 
um, that is uh, caused by these uh, decadal scale um, climate oscillations is, uh, appears to be um, increasing the amount of demolic acid. And that, I think that gives some strong support to our hypothesis from our experiment. By the way, here's the blob bloom here. And you can see how it correlates with the malic acid and also um, the, uh, the PDO in index. So how about the future? It's kind of scary. This is the prediction from a paper by Kevol et al. Um, for the Eastern Pacific Ocean. Um, and by um, the 2050 to 2100 minus the past, uh, this is how much we expect temperatures to increase by the last 50 years of this century, uh, by up to two to four degrees throughout the North Pacific. And so basically they're talking about having a blob boom that is permanent out there if this comes to pass. And as a lot of you know, here is the blob bloom in 2015. Um, a picture of that in August of 2015. But what's really scary is here is the North Pacific last week. This is September 12th, a week ago, and it looks very much like another heat wave event is building up in the North Pacific. Um, it's not as intense as the blob yet. The water, the hot water is not as deep. It hasn't quite um, uh, come on shore in some areas. Um, it's not as intense and uh, there's a lot of hope from NOAA and elsewhere that this uh, bloom is, or that this uh, warm water uh, heat wave is going to dissipate, but it's very possible that it's not going to. And we're gonna go straight into another blob boom event um, this year. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. But I think what the lesson from this is, we urgently need to look at interactions of other global change variables with ocean acidification, not just ocean acidification alone, because warming and ocean acidification together could give you much different results than you get from just looking at a single variable. And they're both happening together. So here is an experiment that um, we uh, um, are doing right now, supported by our, our C grant funding. So my student, Kyla Kelly, has um, taken a, um, a uh, culture of a toxic pseudonychia, and she's looking at an interactive effect. So this uh, new project that we're just starting is going to look at interactions between acidification, warming, uh, nutrient source and also solar radiation and and we really want to get a handle on the interactions between these variables because we think those are going to be as important or more so than just the changes in individual um, global change processes like warming or ocean acidification we need to look at all of these in the same experiments this is the first experiment, just preliminary data that she, um, she came up with, with this toxic um, isolate of uh, Australis that we have. Um, and what she looked at was she looked at photosynthetically active radiation, that's normal sunlight that uh, cells use to photosynthesize, but she also looked at the um, uh, sunlight plus UV um, radiation. Why do we do that? Well, um, the reason that we also are interested in UV is because of that one aspect of climate change that I mentioned, which is the shallowing of the ocean's mixed layer. It's going to hold um, phytoplankton, including pseudonychia, much closer to the surface. They're going to get a bigger dose of not only the kind of uh, um, solar radiation that helps photosynthesis, but also the damaging UVB rays that um, come from the sun. And because of the energy of UVB, it is quickly absorbed by the water. So it's only a problem in the top few meters of the water. The problem is climate change has the um, potential to push pseudonychia closer to the surface where they are um, more um, uh, 
they are more exposed to UVB. And so she looked at UVB and she looked at um, nitrogen source and temperature. So these, uh, the reason we looked at nitrate versus urea is there have been papers out that um, suggest that more demolic acid is produced from the organic nitrogen source urea than from nitrate. Also, nitrate comes from natural upwelling. Urea is the kind of thing you get from sewage treatment plants or agricultural runoff. It could be an, uh, a model for, um, uh, for anthropogenic nitrogen. And then she looked at two temperatures, 20 and 25 um, degrees. So this is her um, experimental matrix, is the interactions between UV stress, nitrogen source and temperature. And so let's go through her results. These are just the growth rates. We're still analyzing the demolic acid samples right now. But the first thing you can notice is that the cells grown under um, just photosynthetically active sun sunlight grow much faster than the ones that um, are exposed to UVB. And what I have to tell you is this is a really low dose of UVB. We've done experiments with other algae this, um, uh, this phytoplankton, this, this Pseudonychia, is really sensitive to UVB. And so it really reduces its growth rate. So the first thing is it grows much faster with just sunlight than when you add UV radiation in, um, trying to um, mimic what may happen in a future shallower mixed layer. Um, you can also notice that the highest uh, growth rates are at the warm temperature with nitrate, um, again, in the um, photosynthetically active radiation treatment. And the other thing you can notice is, although growth rates are really low in all the treatments, when we include a, a really um, modest dose of UVB, they are highest in the warm urea treatment, so it seems uh, our preliminary um, hypothesis from this is that um, growth on organic nitrogen at warmer temperatures may confer some resistance to UV um, damage. So I'm going to start um, winding it up here. Um, I want to talk to some of the students perhaps that are out there listening. Some of you may be interested in doing some of these uh, um, multiple uh, variable experiments for global change um, um, in ver with various types of marine organisms such as Pseudonychia. Um, and I just want to talk to you guys for a minute and give you maybe a resource that you can go to that might help you to put together your experiments because um, Kyle is doing these experiments. I showed you her first one there. Right now she's starting one there. She's looking at interactions between warming and acidification and light. Um, so we're using three variables. Um, and um, coincidentally, this is uh, um, the variables that we're showing in this uh, graph that we put into a paper we published a couple years ago. This is not Pseudonychia, it's another phytoplankton, but it's just to illustrate a point. So these are a bunch of experiments um, that were done with the same species, and uh, they varied uh, acidification, CO2, they varied temperature, and they varied light, but they all use different levels of these variables. And so um, you get this kind of uh, experimental, if you think of it as a meta space here, and I try, we've tried to um, portray it in three dimensions, um, you get this experimental meta space that's all over the place. So maybe it's not surprising that the uh, results of these experiments vary a lot because they're really not looking at the same interactions between these variables. The other issue with doing multiple variable global change experiments is they get big really fast. So you start off with triplicate um, uh, replicates of two, uh, with one variable, you have six bottles, the high and a low treatment, six bottles. If you add another variable, you have 12 bottles. If you add a third variable, you have 24 bottles. If you put in a fourth variable and start to get more realistic towards what's really happening to these cells in the ocean, 
you have 48 bottles to handle. So it gets out of control very quickly. And there are ways you can deal with that problem of having um, the experiment spiral out of control. So I just wanted to uh, point the students who are interested in working on this to the METAL website. I'm a member of the SCORE 149 Working Group, the Scientific Committee for Ocean Research. And we are trying to um, work out some of the difficulties with these complex multiple variable global change experiments and help people to design experiments. So you can go to this website, this metal website, and you can, it's a, a guide to run, a best practice guide for running multiple variable experiments in ocean research, like the ones that I would argue we need to do to understand the Pseudonychia demoic acid problem in a complex changing ocean. So if you look down here, you'll see um, there's learning material that's background for uh, experimental design. There's a decision support tool that will help you to pick um, ways to design your experiment. There's a video gallery with a lot of us from the, um, the committee talking about aspects of experimental design for multiple variable experiments. And there's a PDF handbook, best practices handbook you can download. But the, to me, the funnest part is there's a simulator that you can click on and that will let you design and run an online simulated global change experiment of your own. You can pick how many variables, you can pick what treatments you use, and uh, you can do a simulated variable and it will give you simulated results that you can then practice analyzing. And uh, the uh, um, one of the things this website will do is it'll let you build <clears throat> your own topography or landscapes of responses to global change variables. So if you can um, envision this, so here is a graph of a response. So let's say demoic acid production uh, it could be a response. Here is one driver, maybe that's ocean acidification. Uh, here's another driver, that's CO2. So the response of demoic acid to the interaction between these two stressors is going to have some shape in three dimensions um, that you can envision. And uh, this is the kind of thing, then you can choose where to put your experimental treatments that are going to give you the most information. So here's another topography um, of a theoretical or a hypothetical um, interaction between two drivers. And here's where the student chose to put their treatments. Now, it's probably not a very good um, place to put it because they would have missed the most important part of this feat, which is this large feature where the response goes way up in the middle here because of where they chose to put their, uh, their treatments in, in their experimental matrix. So this is the kind of problems it can help you to solve. Um, hopefully you can have fun playing with it and maybe it'll help you design a better experiment and you can help us tackle this really complex problem of how do you deal with a uh, multiple variable experiments when um, that is what's really going to give you the best answer to what's going to happen to Pseudonychia and all other marine organisms in a, a, an ocean where many things are changing at the same time. So that's all I have for today. Um, this is a, um, where you go if you want to get a PDF of this webinar. Actually, uh, this is an older version of my talk, which uh, the newer one got deleted. I will probably put the newer one up for you instead of this one. Um, uh, and you can contact uh, Diane Pleschner Steele if you have any questions about uh, CCAN. Um, all right. Uh, all right, Dave. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, we'll open the floor to begin our discussion. Please type the questions or comments you have for Dr. Hutchins into the question box in the control panel. If you have questions about the content of today's presentation, feel free to contact Dr. Hutchins. His 
Email address can be found in the questions control panel. Thanks again to Dr. Hutchins for his taking time to offer his expertise and perspectives on how ocean acidification works hand in hand with warming and other global change stressors to promote pseudonizia. A video recording and PDF of this session will be shortly available on the CCAN website. You can also join CCAN Listserv on the CCAN website where you can also learn about CCAN activities and future webinars. You should also check out the Ocean Acidification Information Exchange and join the CCAN section. Great, well, um, there's a couple questions coming in. And Bruce, we can see you. Um, I haven't, uh, so there's a question from Jason. He's obviously from the East Coast. He has an oyster hatchery on the East Coast and he's identified four other smaller hatcheries that had experienced total mortalities around six days post spawn. We are, all, we are all separated by 30 miles at most. None of us thought to test for domoic acid. Are there any fast tools to detect domoic acid better than others? Or is there another test that might be faster? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, analyzing for domoic acid, there are several ways to do it. Um, probably the best way, the way that we try to use is by um, HPLC, high performance liquid chromatography. A lot of environmental um, agencies have access to HPLC. You need to, um, you need to get some protocols going to do that and you need to have the instrument. If you don't have that available, there's actually some um, ELISA kits that you can buy. So ELISA is an immunological method uh, that uh, is not as quantitative as HPLC, but it is cheaper and quicker to get measurements of domoic acid. So you just order the commercial kit and uh, it's, it's basically like a color metric assay that's pretty simple to, to test um, for domoic acid. Great, and, and if I can, this is Terry King from Washington Sea Grant. Jason, if you, um, in your high health protocol, you should have a process by which you hold sample um, and you can freeze it for toxin analysis at a different time, but even looking for um, phytoplankton species in your source water that might have um, one of these organisms in it that causes domoic acid would be good to know also. Um, and if you need a link to any of your, you know, biotoxin monitoring programs, let me know and we'll see if we can connect you to somebody, okay? Any other questions? I don't see any right now. Um, I did put up Dave's contact information in the chat box so we can see that and he's sitting in his office for us. Um, one of the questions that I had for you, Dave, was, you know, this newest bloom that we've got and the, the data that you had that showed when the temperature got to a certain point, it seemed to turn on the toxins. Is there something your team is going to be doing now to explore that or exploit that a little bit more? Yeah, I mean, this is a part of our... Um project that we just are uh, ramping up right now with our, our Sea Grant uh, supported project. Um, we are really interested in looking at the relationship just between temperature and demoic acid production. There's been some controversy over whether the really high uh, demoic acid uh, levels seen in the blob bloom were the result of the temperature per se or perhaps nutrient limitation when uh, when upwelling was um, kind of compromised later in the, in the warm water um, event. So some people think it was from silicate limitation. Uh, we think that that is quite possibly uh, one of the reasons they started making demoic acid is if silicate or phosphorus ran out, but that it's quite likely that those warm temperatures, again, like, like acidification does, interact with nutrient limitation and increase the amount of demoic acid they are already making. And so that's part of what we're looking at. We're interested in the interactions between temperature, nutrient availability, but also ocean acidification and um, solar radiation, for instance. So we're trying to do those multiple variable things, but we will be looking at temperature alone too. And that, that uh, experiment I showed you was just a single isolate. I do think we need to look at more different isolates 
and the responses of their toxin uh, production and their growth to temperature um, alone. And so we also need to do to get a, a broader view of that. Thank you for that. Any questions for Dave? I'm monitoring the chat box. Um, Dave, I will tell you, Stephanie Moore, uh, the, the paper that Stephanie um, was, you know, lead on with the temperature um, change, you know, the two degree change was very eye opening. And we actually shared that at our Pacific Shellfish Sanitation Conference um, for health officials. And it was very eye opening when she presented that to us and people started thinking about long term effects and change in temperature overall. Yeah, that's a great paper and that graphic in particular really gives you an idea of how a warming ocean is going to expand the um, window, the bloom window for these um, harmful algal bloom species. It's not just going to get a little longer, but as the ocean gets warmer and warmer, they're going to be able to bloom almost year round in places that like Puget Sound that are too cold for them for most of the year. And yeah, her paper and then that, um, that graphic really do a good job of getting that across. Um, I'm afraid, I'm worried that if the ocean is really switching over to a warm mode as predicted and as we may be seeing happening again with a new heat wave event building up out there, I'm really worried we're gonna go into a mode where the North Pacific is permanently vulnerable to these massive, really toxic Pseudonychia blooms, where this happens every year or almost every year. Um, I really think that that's something we need to worry about. So many things to deal with. So I don't see any further questions. Bruce, are you back online? Let's see. So, so uh, maybe I'll take one question before I close this up. What do you think, Dave, about a lot of uh, fish populations are, are moving around a lot also that, that it seems to me that the, the habitats that a lot of fish have been traditionally found in are starting to change. And I was just wondering, does, does you know, different portions of the ocean and the Pseudonychia bloom, are they stronger along the coast or offshore or you know, kind of how do the population change um, movements play into where we expect to see the halves? Are the, the movements of the fish uh, populations or of the demoic acid? Well, is there a chance that the fish are going to move into more highly toxic waters than, the, the, than where, we, where they traditionally are? Say anchovies is, you know, a lot of the population's kind of offshore population, but if it moves onshore, is that going to affect their kind of uh, risk of, of encountering a strong hab bloom. It certainly could, Bruce. I mean, yeah, um, the Pseudonychia blooms don't generally happen out in the middle of the North Pacific gyre. They do happen uh, in sort of the shelf waters, over the shelf waters of the coast. So if a fish species is, is changing its distribution, it's certainly possible they could be moving into or out of the real hot spots for demoic acid production. And yeah, just, I mean, I showed data about har harmful algal bloom species <clears throat> are changing their ranges too. So they're moving as the temperature of the water changes, they're moving into new areas where they've never been seen before. Of course, the fish are even more mobile than the microorganisms. So they're moving around too. Um, and as you're probably aware, during the blob bloom, uh, a lot of the um, normal fish, um, uh, stocks that we have along the west coast like anchovies and sardines were really hard hit but we also saw a lot of tropical species moving up into that warm water um, so things like albacore and various tuna and so forth are likely to come up become a lot more um, common off of California and you know if there's a big demoic acid bloom going on it may not do the fishermen any good to have new fish stocks to um, fish for because they may be toxic too. They're going to uh, accumulate if there's a demoic acid bloom going on, even fish that are coming in 
from warmer water and are more comfortable in a warmer ocean are also going to be um, contaminated by demoic acid if they're in, coming into where the blooms are, are happening. So it, you're right, it's a complicated scenario where the fish are moving around, the blooms are moving around, but in the, anywhere that they intersect, there's going to be problems. Well, uh, uh, thanks again, Dave. It was a great presentation. And uh, oh, well, everything having to do with this subject is scary, but <laughs> uh, I want to thank everybody for attending our CCAN Ocean, <laughs> Ocean Acidification Roundtable today. We welcome any feedback, further questions, or suggestions on topics for future webinar series. You can submit input by emailing us at, at the address listed on the site. And thanks again for taking the time to join us. This is the end of the session. Okay, well, thank you, and thanks for listening.